Hello, everybody, and welcome to our inaugural edition of Monday Night Travels with Rick Steves Europe. Um, today, we are going to be adventuring in the Austrian and Italian Alps. Um, without further ado, I am going to turn, turn things over to Rick. Rick, over to you. All right, Gabe, thank you very much. And thanks to all of you for tuning in and joining us on our first ever Monday night travel. And today we're going to go to the Alps of Austria and Italy. And it's a party. I, you know, I, I need to talk to people about travel. I don't know about you, but it's something about just being in touch and sharing and enthusing. And, and that's what we're going to do today. And uh, I'm just, I want to remind you, we're, we're all together on this. I'm here in my living room. You're in your living room. This is the party. And, um, I got my wine. You gotta have some wine when you go into Europe. And uh, uh, I got my mixed nuts and I've got my blueberries and I've got a beautiful little platter of uh, cheese and crackers. And if it looks like it's already been nibbled on, this is our second show today. We just were sold out on the first, as far as a free event can be sold out. And thank you for tuning in a little later. This is a, a series that is every Monday, uh, at six o'clock Seattle time, nine o'clock on the East Coast. So uh, right now, as I mentioned, we're gonna kick off the first of three shows on the Alps. And the next three weeks will be the Alps today, Austria and Italy, next week, Switzerland, the next week will be France. So let me uh, get this all figured out here properly. And we're gonna start at the highest point in Germany on the Zugspitze the best of Europe. And right now I'm the highest person in Germany proving. And I want to say I'm the highest person in Germany. And I want to just kind of set the stage here because for me, ah, oh, this is exciting. The day before I was in Scotland, then I flew to Munich to meet my crew and we're off on an 18 day shoot to do these three shows. We're going to see the first show right this evening. And uh, it's a scramble and we're parts of three days in every spot because it's very very weather dependent and we got good weather right off the bat so we started on top of the Zugspitze and I'm just on the top here I'm feeling the altitude I'm looking across at my cameraman who's on the terrace of a restaurant and I've scrambled up there before the tourists come I gotta say I'm just I've been a very intensive travel experience working on my material in Britain and in Scotland and I was coming down with some kind of a cold or something the fact is I was just getting a nodule on my vocal cord so I'm losing Using my voice and I'm going to be sort of whispering uh, or not being able to project like I like to. So that's concerning me. I'm feeling the altitude. I can't remember my lines very well. And I've got all of these tourists coming up that are going to mess up my beautiful solo on the top of the Zugspitze. But I nailed this on camera. Actually, I might not have nailed it because the camera gets so far away, we could put in other audio from other takes and it, it would be able to kind of trick you to make me feel seem uh, smoother than I am. But watch how the camera pulls out and enjoy as we kick it off for the Austria and Italian Alps. At almost anybody can make the summit in Europe's Alps. And from up here, we venture south for the best of the Alps in Austria and in Italy. Thanks for joining us. I love how in Europe, nature and culture mix it up. And here in the Alps, each region has a distinct flavor. In this episode, we'll celebrate both nature and culture in the Alps of Austria and Italy. After conquering the Zugspitze, we'll visit a remote farm in Austria and join in a Tyrolean village festival. Then we cross the Alps, tour a uniquely well-preserved medieval castle and joyride deep into Italy's rugged Dolomite Mountains. After an unforgettable hike, we'll catch our breath in Europe's largest high-altitude meadow, and then enjoy some more Alpine folk music. Germany, Austria, and Italy come together high in the Alps. We start in Bavaria at the Zugspitze. For 
So I want to bust in here and just remind you, these maps are very important to me because we make these shows to entertain, but we also make these shows to help people turn their travel dreams into smooth and affordable reality. And it's very important to set the set the scene here and let you know exactly where we're, we're going to be going. The maps are made by Dave Herline, who's our lead cartographer. He makes all the maps for all of our books, and Dave makes gorgeous maps for our shows. Also, right after this map, we're going to have the on-camera that sort of kicks off the body of the show. And I want to remind you, the on-cameras, when I'm talking to the camera, actually, it's really a fun challenge to choose the best spots for these on-cameras. And I, I think you could like pay attention to that over the course of this show for an example of that. And a lot of times we'll get one good enough take in the can, and then we'll try to do it again and again to get something fun in the background. In this case, I had one in the can, but we waited until we could just get it where the gondola is taken off, and we had that opportunity to grab the on-camera with the gondola in the background. By the way, I just slid my image of myself, the little picture in picture, down to the corner. You might want to be sure that you position me down in the corner and not too big on your screen because I'm just going to be a little guy talking in the corner, but you're going to be watching primarily the show. There we travel south into the Tyrol, an historic region that today is split between Austria and Italy. We visit Innsbruck and Hall before crossing Brenner Pass into Italy. From Castle Ruth, we explore the Dolomites. Across the Alps, mountain resorts are investing in their infrastructure. And here in Bavaria, they've made it quick and easy to experience their mightiest peak. The Zugspitze at nearly 10,000 feet is Germany's highest mountain. So right there, we're just driving and we knew we need to get an establishing shot of the Zugspitze and I didn't know where we were gonna get it, but we're driving and scouting and looking and this is perfect. So we all stopped the car and we kind of double parked on the road and the cameraman jumped over the fence with Simon and, and they set up the tripod there. And there we got the classic establishing shot of the biggest mountain in Germany. Now, in a moment, we're gonna get on the lips and go to the very top of that. And I want you to think about if you were producing a TV show, you've got two hours up there and you gotta get the on cameras and you you got to kind of check on how are you going to cover the script. The script is written and we've got to cover it by cobbling together all these images. So we have to scout first and then we make a shot list and then the cameraman and Simon go around and, and, uh, and get all the script covered. And you'll notice that as we're climbing up to that very tallest point, it gets so crowded of course, it's just kid stuff, but I could imagine the congestion on the top of a, of, a, of a traumatic mountain like Mount Everest. And right there, even on the Zugspitze, it's just overwhelmed with tourists. We were lucky to get up there before all the crowds hit so we could get it all to ourselves. So here we're going to cover a little module of the show of the highest mountain peak in Germany, the Zugspitze. And this cable car zips us to the top in 10 minutes. The cable is about three miles long. It's supported by only one pylon, and it stretches nearly two miles to the summit with no support at all. While there are many higher mountains in the Alps, the Zugspitze is unique. It stands alone, offering a view of hundreds of peaks in Germany, Austria, Italy, and even Switzerland. The mountain marks the border between Germany and Austria. From here, the Alps arc like a grand alpine symphony, from Vienna way in the east, all the way to the French Riviera, where these mountains finally plunge into the Mediterranean. The Zugspitze summit attracts huge crowds, as on so many European mountaintops, you'll find restaurants, shops, and well-entertained tourists. The Zugspitze is famed for a cold and ghostly wind that can really howl in the winter. This hiker's hut has been perched here for well over a century. And thanks to these beefy cables, it's never been blown off the top. The summit, first climbed in 1820, is marked by a golden cross, carried up here by hardy villagers back in 1851. Today, with the help of iron steps and cables, it's climbed, either from the distant valley floor or from the adjacent summit restaurant, by families, seniors, and even travel writers. These days, escaping the tourist crowds takes initiative, and having a car can be helpful. We've crossed into Austria and are ready to explore. Detailed maps show tiny roads you might not realize exist. For a car hiker's look at life high in the Alps, we're switchbacking up to a 5,000-foot-high perch. 
From the end of the road, it's an easy 20-minute stroll to the Balder Alm Farm. Look at that. Can you imagine turning the corner and coming upon this farm high in the Alps and hiking into it or biking into it or parking your car and walking on a level little lane to get there? I love the opportunity to take my viewers and all of you guys to these favorite discoveries of mine. I discovered this back when I was a kid in my 20s. I haven't been there for about 10 years and I was so excited to get back with the camera crew. When we do this, we have to call in advance and talk to the farmer and you know, I were a TV crew and uh, he, we think he understands and he says, no problem, you know, and we go there and uh, uh, then he sees our big camera and he gets nervous and we just, uh, you know, it's all this kind of finessing it. Uh, but uh, when we go, we have positive serendipity and negative serendipity. The negative serendipity was it was so hot that all the cows were in the barn. It was just too hot for the cars, cows to be outside. The positive serendipity, the old farmer, Hans, 80 years old, he's uh, got done with his work early and he sat down and started a whittle and we got to show him whittling a cow. And uh, one thing I wanted to do was teach how the old traditional vernacular architecture worked so smartly with the cows providing heat and the hay upstairs and so on. So we got there, scouted it out and found the perfect spot to do that on camera to share this little insight into Alpine culture. Check it out, the Balder Alm Farm. It's actually a cluster of three family-run dairy farms with 70 cows sharing their meadow amid staggering mountain views. These families have eked out a living on these farms with remarkably little change for generations. Hans, while well, well into his 80s now, is still involved in the family farm. Today, it's so hot, the cows are hanging out in the barn, but there's still work to be done. And with the chores finished, Hans enjoys whittling in his spare time. His favorite subject? Cows, of course. The traditional Alpine farmhouse was energy efficient, considering the technology of the day. The family lived here on the middle floor. The cows got the ground floor. There's about 40 cows just down there. They'd catch the body heat of the cows and that would help to heat the family. And the hayloft provided insulation and the assurance there'd be enough food to get the cows through the winter. And on this farm, the system works to this day. These days, family farms struggle to survive. Here in Europe, many manage only with the help of government subsidies and by tapping into the tourist trade. A steady stream of hikers and bikers work hard to reach this idyllic spot. And Hans and his family are happy to serve a hearty lunch or a refreshing drink. From up here, it's all downhill to Innsbruck. Filling the valley floor, it's one of the biggest cities within the Alps. Innsbruck was an important outpost of the Habsburg Empire. For five centuries, it was their capital of the Tyrol, with all the imperial trappings. A grand church, a stately palace, and an extravagant balcony fit for a king. This much-admired golden roof was built for the Habsburg Emperor Maximilian in 1494. The roof, with over 2,000 gilded copper tiles, remains the town's centerpiece. Innsbruck's historic center is now a pedestrian zone. Looking past the crowds, it still feels like a once grand provincial capital. The city's folk museum is a medieval Tyrolean home show. A medieval Tyrolean home show. I love it. And I also love the thought that you're having a little party with me. I hope you got a good drink, got your mixed nuts, your cheese and crackers. I would normally have white wine in Austria, but um, I'm in the mood for some red wine. Going into a museum like this, this is one of my mm, annoying little passions. To understand the beautiful nature, you need to understand the culture that mixes together with it. And you go to the regional capital and you go to the Tyroler Volkskunst Museum and you celebrate the heritage there. So I go in there with the crew. We always get a shot of Rick walking into the museum with day bag over his shoulder. And uh, then we park the gear and we run around and we sort through all the possibilities. I know what I want to cover because I was bringing tour groups here 20 or 30 years ago. 
And I don't know what's going to be exactly on display and how it's going to look to producer Simon and so on. So we scout the whole place and then we make a shot list and then we cover the script. We write the script a little fancier and uh, we shoot it. And here's where I get to be just part of the crew. I mean, uh, uh, when I look at these shots coming up, anything that is behind glass, I look at it and I just think, yes, that's when Simon and I are like this, holding up this big black cloth, the duvetine, so that you've got the black cutting out all the glare so the cameraman can shoot right through the glass and get right into that intimate, um, you know, Tyrolean wood carving scene that I wanted so badly to get. So here we're ripping ourselves out of the mountains so we can understand the cultural context. And if you see how we teach it here, that's what we like to do with our tour groups. And that's what our guides are so expert at doing. So let's go into the Tyroler Folk Art Museum. Humble as that rural farming community may have been, an artistic touch prevails. The plow seems to honor hard work. One-legged milking stools were finely carved. Finely carved one-legged milking stools? You gotta work that into the show. <laughs> Positive serendipity. Cribs were decorated with religious themes to be sure God watched over the baby. Fantastical characters warded off evil and even served as human scarecrows. Merchants carrying their wares on their backs would hike from village to village. This one sold fine fabric. Intricately whittled dioramas show off the region's tradition of fine wood carving. While this could be any Tyrolean village, upon closer look, it's Bethlehem in the Alps. Bible stories like this nativity scene made most sense to locals when presented in a familiar hometown setting. Today, this manger scene gives you a glimpse of village life in the Tyrol a couple centuries ago. Innsbruck's worth a quick look, but I prefer a smaller town with fewer tourists. Tonight, we're sleeping five miles downstream in the town named Hall in Tyrol. Now, notice right now how we have this amazing shot with the camera going up like on a crane over the town. This is the first year that we've had a drone and I love having a drone because when you do a town like Hall or wherever you're featuring, you got to get a wide establishing shot. And in the old days, that meant driving around up in the hills to look for a wide shot. It took a long time and it could be very frustrating. Here we are in the balcony of our hotel, sending the drone up and getting a gorgeous establishing shot. Now, it was so hot here in Hall, it was like pushing 100 degrees, nobody was out, and it made the town really pretty dead. Uh, I love the town, and it's a great home base for visiting Innsbruck. I like Hall more than Innsbruck, actually. So here you're going to see us going into town and uh, writing in the fact that there's no liveliness going on because it's so darn hot, and then working to enliven it, we go into the mint and pull out the, uh, the uh, anvil and watch them make a coin to give it a little bit of life. But whenever you are looking at our shows, if you wonder what month it's shot in, if it's in the Mediterranean region, south of the Alps, it would be in April or May. If it's in the Alps or north of the Alps, it would always be in July or August. So this show was, was shot actually in a little bit of July and a little bit of August. Uh, you don't wanna travel in the Mediterranean these days, it's so hot. And these days it's even hot north of the Alps. It was really, really hot while we were in this part of the Alps. Even before the time of the Habsburgs, Hall was an important trading city. Back then, its medieval center was actually larger than Innsbruck's. Today's laid-back Hall cradles its market square. Its pastel buildings and quaint streets feel refreshingly traditional. Actually, too traditional if you're trying to accomplish anything more than a leisurely lunch from noon till two, when everything closes. During the Habsburg rule, Hall's Castle served as the local mint. Old-time methods are still used here to strike shiny souvenir coins. 500 years ago, this was how you made money. The town's name, Hall, means salt. Hall was so important because it was a center of salt mining and trade. In the past, salt was mined like a precious mineral. It was so valuable because before modern refrigeration, it was used to preserve food. Can you hear how I'm whispering? I mean, this was my 
my the bane of my shoot for 18 days i couldn't project any more than this so we had to choose quiet areas where i'm not talking about the crowds and the traffic so we found a little courtyard here coming up we're talking about salt being so important it's the foundation of the wealth of this town you wouldn't have any of the fancy buildings without the salt so we have to illustrate that go into the church and look for the patron saint of salt miners or maybe a little cupid uh up in the up in the corners with a big barrel of salt just reminding that salt is white gold. So that's what we got here is a celebration of salt and a tour guide that has to whisper in the courtyards because he's got a little nudge on his vocal cord, just like Dr. Fauci. Him and I had the same problem, cut it off, and then your voice comes back to you. I was thankful to be able to whisper and get through this and then do the uh, voiceover that we filmed when we got back to Seattle with my normal voice again. Salt helped people survive the winters. That's why they called it white gold. Back when salt was money, Hall was loaded. Its seal features a barrel of salt. The town's elegant architecture and rich church made it clear that in its day, Hall was a local powerhouse. While the church's structure is mostly 15th century Gothic, the decor inside is 17th century Baroque. And with a close look, you can see the wealth was founded on salt. Miners generated the wealth that paid for the lavish altars, extravagant starbursts, and this statue of the miner's patron, St. Barbara. And even the little cupids carry barrels of salt. The old pedestrian bridge leads over the milky, glacier-fed Inn River to our hotel. Gasthof Bottle is run by the Steiner family, there she is, Frau Steiner. I love Frau Steiner. I've, I've enjoyed her little guest house ever since I was in my 20s. She was featured in my very first guidebook to this region. And uh, we've taken our groups there for many, many years. And now it's Frau Steiner, her daughter and her granddaughter running the show. So I was really happy to fill this in. We filmed there 15 or 20 years ago and Frau Steiner fed me dumplings and so charming the way she explained how the dumplings are part of the local culture. And we filmed her in the kitchen. We filmed all the dumplings, but normally our shows come in a little bit long and we have to cut them down to size. It's a nice problem to have actually. But unfortunately, Frau Steiner and her dumplings pretty much hit the, um, hit, hit the uh, what do you call it, editing room floor. But I asked Frau Steiner if she could gather the local folk troupe, the band and the dancers together under her chestnut tree. And historically in the Tyrol and in Bavaria, you gather together under the chestnut tree to enjoy Gemütlichkeit. That is the local coziness. So, you know, quintessentially Tyrolean and Bavarian. So in a moment, we're going to have the perfect under the chestnut tree convivial uh, celebration. I want to remind you, it's almost all locals, just a, a few tourists, but mostly locals. It's celebrated by and for the locals. And this is an example of a cultural cliche, slap dancing and yodeling, that my guides and I work very hard to share with our tourists on our tour groups with an understanding of why it's important. 800 years ago, it's the only way you could flirt with the girl or the boy in the neighboring farm would be to get together under the chestnut tree and uh, dance and wink and, and flirt and slap dance and yodel. Check this out. Love a family-run hotel. And here, three generations are hard at work. I've enjoyed Frau Steiner's warm welcome for a generation. She makes each guest feel right at home. Now her daughter Sonia runs the show with the same flair for hospitality. And clearly, granddaughter Laura is next in line. We're dining on Tyrolean favorites, Spätzle, a traditional kind of pasta, and dumplings. As is typical of the guest houses I like to recommend, Frau Steiner shares the local culture, and that includes both food and music. Tonight, under the convivial chestnut tree, the town band and the dancing group are performing for each other as much as the hotel guests. The Tyrolean Brass Band starts things off. The maiden with the schnapps makes sure to lubricate as necessary. Oh, you always need a maiden with schnapps. And uh, I'm such a lightweight. I get my schnapps here and I just wish I would have thrown it down. But I'm thinking, oh, I got to drink this stuff. And oh, I got to do some writing tonight. Every night I spend a couple of hours working on the scripts and it is no fun working on scripts at 11 at night when you've had too much schnapps. So here I wimp out, but we're still having a great time. 
Then it's time for the dancers. I love how folk dancing recalls the courting rituals of medieval societies. Dancing was an acceptable way to meet the girl or guy from the next farm, back in an age when simply connecting was a challenge. And with slap dancing like this, what girl wouldn't say yes? Heading south, we cross Europe's cultural and geographical divide, driving from the Germanic world over the Alps into the Mediterranean world, Italy. The Brenner Pass has been the easiest way over the Alps since ancient Roman times. 2,000 years ago, Roman legions followed this route, the Via Claudia, as they marched north to conquer much of Europe. Sections of the ancient road are still preserved. Deep grooves are reminders of countless wagon wheels that followed this ferry route. Today, the Brenner Pass is easier than ever to cross as drivers arc gracefully along one of the engineering wonders of Europe. From the top of the Europa Brucke, or Europe's Bridge, it feels like just another freeway. But from the windy old road at the valley floor, it looks like a mighty sculpture. That's the thing of beauty. And it's nostalgic for me because for many years I drove over the pass on the little road before they had the big road. And then after they had the big road when I didn't have enough money to pay for the big roll toll. And I remember looking up at that thinking, ah, oh, this looks like concrete ballet. It says cars with enough money to pay the tolls can wing over it. Of course, now almost everybody goes, well, everybody goes on the big road. And uh, it's just a real blessing when you're exploring the Alps. By the way, if you're a tour guide, you remind people, we said Zum Wohl last night in Germany, but now, mm, to your health is Sante. So we're going over the cultural divide of Europe from Germanic Europe to Romantic Europe to the Italian corner of Europe. And I want to remind you, I'm pausing a lot and it's messing up the show. So I apologize for that. But this event is to pause and share little extras. If you want to see the show without pauses, you can do that anytime at ricksteves.com. You can see all of our shows, including this one. And you can also find all of our shows on YouTube, on our YouTube channel. Okay, let's go to Italy. The freeway zips drivers from Innsbruck to the Italian border in about 30 minutes. How about pasta for lunch? While the Autobahn in Germany and Austria is toll-free, the Italian Autostrada has plenty of toll booths. But that's nothing new here. This crossing has long been a gauntlet of toll booths and forts. Empires from Roman times to World War II understood the strategic value of Brenner Pass. This fortress, called Franzenfest, was built in the 1830s. It was one of the mightiest of its day. A huge investment by the Habsburg Emperor in Vienna, it was designed to protect his empire from invasions from the south. Throughout the Middle Ages, this was the trade route that connected the Germanic world with cities like Venice and Florence. When medieval traders reached this valley, chances are they were stopped, willingly or not, at a castle like this. Reifen Ho! Reifenstein. Look at that. This is one of my favorite castles in Europe and could be my favorite castle interior anywhere. And as a tour guide, I love nothing more than to make a phone call, as I did just a few years ago. Just a couple of years ago, I was the tour guide for our Best of the Alps uh, My Way tour. And uh, we actually made a private tour for this. Uh, anybody can make a phone call and, and for a few euros get a tour of this great castle. But now I get to take my film crew in and share it with you. And I like this castle because it illustrates the importance of bottling up strategically a very uh, critical, you know, um, mountain pass to 
to control all the trade, but you go into this castle and you tick all the boxes of what you want to see in a medieval castle. It's the best preserved medieval castle interior in Europe. Wallpaper, uh, the, the big wooden boxes where the knights all slept together, a cistern, you've got wallpaper. It's just an amazing experience and a dungeon. And then you look across the valley and you see the other sister castle where they could very easily stop anybody from getting back and forth. So what a thrill to be able to make a phone call or have a guidebook that tells you the phone number or take a tour that knows how to take you here and check out the best castle in this part of Europe. Reifenstein Castle was built to control trade, but Reifenstein has grown more welcoming with age. While it used to take a battering ram to get these doors open, now all it takes is a few euros. Hello. Hey. Hello. Welcome in Reifenstein. Reifenstein offers one of Europe's most intimate looks at medieval castle life. The actual count and countess of Reifenstein are determined to preserve their historic castle. I got to bust in here and point out, look at all the wood that you see there. Now, all over Europe, you see ruined castles with, with, with no wood. It's just stone because that's what survives through the centuries. Here we have the wood. So you can then go to other castles. And when you see the holes in the wall, you know that's where they would support the staircases and the balconies and so on. So here we're getting a better look at what castle life was like 800 years ago. And again, that's what as guides we love to show. So people can then put things together in their minds as they sightsee with a little more context. The castle caretaker shows visitors around on tours several times a day. We're enjoying a private visit. While the castle was originally built a thousand years ago, what we see today is about 500 years old. It's a rare opportunity to see an intact medieval castle interior. Within its mighty stone walls, hefty timbers flesh out the staircases and rooms. The woodwork is artful and the engineering ingenious. While there was no well, rainwater was collected into a cistern that functions to this day. Paintings adorning the walls feature only one family, the noble German family that has owned the castle for centuries. Here, the lord and lady seem proud of what must have been an impressive fortified home in its day. Here's a fun fix for a tipsy lord. Too much to drink? A clever funnel guides the key right into the hole. From the looks of the sumptuous green room, medieval life for the nobility was pretty comfortable. The painted walls are original, a rare example of secular art surviving from the Middle Ages. With voluptuous swoops and curls, this scene, frescoed in 1498, is a fantasy of elves, jesters, archers, and fruity symbols of fertility. Mm. You can catch a view across the valley to Reifenstein's sister castle. Two castles like these, strategically straddling the valley, could control much of the trade passing between Germany and Italy. To exercise his power and collect those tolls, the castle lord needed a small personal army. This room is the knight's quarters. Up to eight men shared each of these boxes, complete with hay for maximum comfort. Imagine. 40 snoring knights packed into one room. There was no fire for warmth, as an accident would set the entire place up in flames. So the knights huddled together to stay warm. And every good castle needs a dungeon, used mostly to enforce the payment of debts. The only way in or out was through this hatch. If you couldn't pay your bills, you could spend days down here. No food, only a little water. Okay, enough about debts and dungeons. We've escaped, and we're on our way to Italy's dramatic limestone rooftop. The Dolomites, with their distinct and jagged peaks, offer some of the best alpine thrills in Europe. And these mighty mountains seem to protect the traditional culture in the region's villages and bucolic farmsteads. Historically, the Tyrol was its own state. Today, that region is divided, part in Austria and part in Italy. The Italian part is called South Tyrol. The region is a mix of the two cultures and officially bilingual. While the traditional economy is farming, today tourism is also big. Skiing in winter, hiking in summer. 
the Great Dolomite Road, beautifully engineered, leads to the nearly 7,000-foot-high Sella Pass. It's great for a joyride and famously a big challenge for bikers. Making it to the summit is always a good excuse for a triumphant group photo. I got to say, our cameraman Carl is an enthusiastic biker, and we cannot drive by bikers without getting a good clip of them. And here we got the bikers at the summit. I also got to say, our editor, Steve Camerano, he is a master editor, and he takes it one step further by being just brilliant with his music. And, and if you, it's the unsung hero, as far as I'm concerned, of our TV shows, is the music that Steve Camerano lays in with these beautiful images. I got to say, this is the second party tonight, and I'm, I'm talking a little more than I was in the first show. So there's a lesson there. Sign up for the first one if you want to see the show less interrupted. But it's so fun to have you with us today because we are sharing our love of Europe and we're climbing Sala Pass in the Dolomite. The Dolomites, it's a back door. It's an underrated part of Europe. Everybody goes to the Alps in Switzerland and France. You got to check out the Italian Alps, the Dolomites. These bold limestone pillars offer something for everybody. This is rock climbing country, thrilling even for spectators. From the town of Ortize, we're catching the Seceda lift. All over this region, the lifts do the climbing fast and easy, depositing hikers sweat-free at thin air trailheads. I, I needed this view because I wanted to show the staggering beauty of the Italian Alps. It's a place called Seceda. And I was there with the help of our friend who runs our hotel in Castle Ruth, Stefan. But this is just incredible. And it's just a short lift ride away from the valley floor right next to Castle Ruth, which is our home base whenever we're in the Italian Alps. Remember, Seceda on your next trip to the Italian Alps. Love walking on a ridge. And with as many nationalities enjoying this scene as there are flowers in the fields, the blissful world up here is one of pristine nature and happy hikers. These slopes are busy with skiers in the winter. When planning, be aware that in early spring and late fall, that's between seasons here in the Dolomites, many lifts, huts, and restaurants are shut down. There, I said something that upset my local friends. They didn't want me to say in the spring and the summer, many of the lifts are shut down and many of the hotels are not open because of course they're needing to promote but we do our best to know the pitfalls and to, to, to massage all of these practical tips into our guidebooks and into our TV shows. So the fact is, this is really busy and really lively in the summer and in the ski season, but the hoteliers and the restaurants pretty much shut down uh, for a month in the spring and a month in the fall to get stuff ready for the next season. And it can be disappointing when you're traveling there during this period. How do I know? I've been there then. And trails can be covered in snow. We're here in summer, and everything's wide open. Everywhere I look feels like an alpine adventure awaiting my arrival. One thing I love about Europe, I've been coming here all my life, and there's still places to discover. The town of Castle Ruth feels like an alpine village rather than a ski resort. That's why I feature it in my Italy guidebook as the ideal home base for exploring the Dolomites. Ah, did you hear that? I slipped in a guidebook plug. <laughs> I gotta be careful not to be annoying that way, but I give myself one guidebook plug in each of our shows. I have an ethic of never including anything in the show that you can't do yourself, and most of what I learned about uh, putting these shows together and writing these scripts, I learned because I was researching the guidebooks. So I always like to remind people, we like our shows to inspire people to do it themselves. And if you want to do it yourself, you've got everything you need to know with the guidebook. A reminder, if you like to have a question answered, now is a good time to type in a question on that widget because we're going to have 15 minutes of Q&A just in a few minutes after this show is over. And I'd love to answer your questions. Oh, by the way, it's cloudy here. 
we did our, yeah, when you're doing a TV show, especially in the Alps, you take your cloudy weather and you do it in the towns and you go inside and so on. And when the weather's good, you're up in the mountains doing your hiking. So that's a real dance. And we, whenever it's a, uh, iffy weather, we will be in the towns instead of up on the mountain peaks. The hyperactive bell tower seems to ring out the wisdom of honoring local traditions. Buildings are painted with murals celebrating the town's rich heritage. Clearly, fire has long been a concern. St. Florian, the patron of firefighters, is shown all over town putting out fires. The town cemetery is like a lovingly tended garden. Entire families share a common plot. Cobbled lanes lead past friendly shops to the welcoming town square. And for generations, the fountain, with its metal cup, has invited all for a refreshing drink. The fountain also watered horses back when coaching inns lined the square. Here in the region of South Tyrol, even though we're in Italy, locals speak German first and Italian second. That's because for centuries, it was in the Austrian Habsburg realm, ruled from Vienna. After World War I, South Tyrol ended up as part of Italy. Mussolini did what he could to Italianize the region. He even gave each city a new Italian name. This town, Castleruth, became Castelrotto. But the region's Germanic heritage endures. You can see it in its prosperity and in its lively folk culture. All right, folk music. And I was uh, hell-bent on getting some Italian Tyrolean folk music. It was raining, and my friends at the hotel lined up the local band, but I didn't have a place for them to play because we wanted them to play outside where you'd have an easy crowd. So we had to scramble around, found a place that would work for the camera and the lighting and the band, and that was the dining room of the hotel. And then we moved out all the tables, the band sat down, and then I had to get an audience. So I scrambled around, and it's mostly local people, and they're sitting there going, what a big, what's the big deal? And then I had to kind of make everybody have a good time. So as you watch this, you will see one annoying American tour guide clinking glasses and going, yeah, yeah, and everything. And just to kind of make the party in a moment, because we have to make a party like that. And then we ask the band to play the same tune four times. And that's because uh, the cameraman, we just have one, has to get the musicians, the wide shot, the dancers, the people. And uh, we just have to do that thing again and again. And then Steve Camerano cuts it all together. I also want to remind you, if you see the, the, the valves on that French horn, those are rotary valves. The trumpets here have rotary valves also. And you may say, what's the big deal about that? I love those rotary valves. When I was 14 years old on my first trip to Europe, I bought a trumpet with rotary valves and played it all the way through high school. It's a beautiful trumpet. But her folk bands have fun keeping that heritage alive. The instruments are traditional, as are the costumes. The blue aprons come from a time when humble workers needed to protect their precious clothing. It's nice to think that these boys are both modern and traditional and their traditions are clearly surviving into the next generation. Castle Ruth is the gateway to Europe's largest alpine meadow, the Alpi di Susi. As automobiles are generally not allowed, visitors approach by cable car. Landing at Kompach, the commercial hub of the meadow, hikers can hop a lift or a shuttle bus to the trailhead of their choice. The Alpi di Susi is a natural preserve at the foot of the mighty Sasso Lungo and Sasso Piato peaks. 
The meadow is three miles wide by seven miles long and seems to float at 6,000 feet above sea level. It's dotted by farm huts and wildflowers, surrounded by dramatic dolomite peaks, and crisscrossed by meadow trails, ideal for equestrians, flower lovers, and walkers. It's and ideal for a lazy travel writer that just wants a beer with the best alpine view anywhere. It's one of my lovely uh, sort of dreams is to remember that this high alpine meadow, it, it seems to me the same ambience as a beach, but it's in the high country and you're surrounded not by sand, but by alpine flowers. And my dream was to sit in a lounge chair enjoying that with a nice beer. And we had a moment and I had the meadow, I had the flowers, but I didn't have the lounge chair, the beer. So I had to run over to a hotel nearby and borrow there. I had to, excuse me, this is a funny story, but I need to borrow your lounge chair. I took it out there and got the gorgeous shot of my dreams. In a moment, we're going to have the close of the show and it'll be back up at Cicada with that glorious view. And you know, when you're making a TV show, the tees, the open and the close, those are the three biggies. You got to get them well. And I can't relax until I've got those in the can. In this show, we got them all early on in the show. And uh, when I was doing the close that you're going to see in just a moment, we did a second close for the one hour special. And uh, this again is the first of a three part series of Alpine episodes, half hour each. Uh, today we're seeing Austria and Italy. Next week, at this time, we're gonna see Switzerland. And two weeks from tonight, we're gonna see on Monday night travel, the Alps of France. They're great shows. And we're gonna distill them all into a just a dynamite one hour best of the Alps special. And we made a close for that show as well as this show in this next little bit. But we're just celebrating the Alps of Italy. Also just right for someone needing a lazy beer with a spectacular view. And completing this storybook Dolomite setting, the spooky Mount Schlern, home of mythical witches, looks boldly into the haze of the Italian peninsula. I hope you've enjoyed our look at the Alps of Austria and Italy, the Tyrol, where nature is wild yet so accessible. Thanks for joining us. I'm Rick Steves. Until next time, keep on traveling. Keep on traveling. So that's it for our best of uh, the Alps in Austria and in Italy. And I do want to remind you that that's the first of a three-part series. And we're just kicking off the first of a never-ending stream of Monday night travels. And I'm so excited because I just am frustrated, frankly, of not being able to get around the country and give talks about travel to stoke people's wanderlust. But we're going to do it right here. And uh, so get that on your calendar. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I hope you've enjoyed our first episode of Monday Night Travels. And now back to Gabe. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Rick, for that fantastic presentation. Um, as Rick said, we are going to get to some questions and answers. Um, I sorted through all of your questions in the widget. Um, but before that, Rick, I was wondering if we could get a quick word from our sponsor. Um, hmm. How are you doing these days? Well, thank you. Our sponsor is Rick Steves Europe. And we love travel and we love to share that with everybody who's watching. And I've got three little show and tell items. Um, last year, I locked myself down, no, not knowing I'd be locked down this year, in order to write this book. And this is called For the Love of Europe. And For the Love of Europe is a 400-page collection of my favorite episodes, my favorite friends, my, my favorite experiences in Europe. And it's just ideal for this year. If you wish you could be traveling, this book, For the Love of Europe, has all of my favorite experiences in my best writing of all. So that would be something that might help us all get through this pandemic. If you like art, my, 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 my favorite co-author when it comes to art and history, Gene Openshaw, uh, partnered with me to write this book, Europe's Greatest 100 Masterpieces. This is a coffee table book featuring our favorite 100 pieces of art. And it's just artfully written, it's beautifully illustrated, and it's just a delight. If you want to sweep through the story of Europe from the pyramids to Picasso with this book, I would say you'll be glad to have it. Also, the major way we make money at Rick Steves Europe is taking bus tours through Europe, and we're doing none of that this year. Uh, last year was our best year ever. We took 30,000 people on 1,200 different tours, uh, and this was our catalog for that. 
fun way to advertise online. And this catalog, we did not print up for 2021, but we've got the same information for our 2022 tours online at ricksteves.com and a PDF of this beautiful full color 64 page catalog of our tours is yours anytime you like if you want to see what we've got with our tours. Of course, we're waiting for this pandemic to get through and patience is the main thing. Taking care of our neighbors is the main thing. Uh, embracing science, having a little leadership from the top down so we can be safe and travel again. We're not going to be the first tour company out of the gates, but when it is stable and reliable and safe, we're going to go back to Europe. And uh, the Rick Steve style of travel is not social distancing. It is, it is getting your cheeks kissed in Paris. It's packing together on the piazzas of Rome and doing the passeggiata. It's going to the pubs of Ireland and hanging out with strangers who they say are just friends who've yet to meet and have another Guinness. And that day will come and it'll come, uh, we don't know when, but when it does come, our team is intact. We're taking good care of our tour members and we're gonna throttle up and we're going back to Europe again. So that is uh, what's up with Rick Steves Europe. And I'm very thankful that we've got our team together. We're patient, we're able to survive this pandemic and we'll get through it. And then we'll all be traveling together again soon. But Gabe, let's have some questions from our attendees tonight. Yes, so the most common question that I received, Rick, from um, people like Ginger and Catherine is they are wondering, first of all, when was this show filmed? Um, and secondly, what would you say is the best time to visit the Alps of Italy and Austria? Okay, well, first of all, uh, we shot this film, I think in July or in August, a little bit of each back in the year 2019. And it was one of the last things we shot. Uh, on our TV show, it's funny, it, we always put the copyright date and the show was produced and finished in 2020. So it says copyright 2020. And then it says, we always in the end of the show say what month it was shot for our travelers to know what they're looking at so they can pack accordingly and so on. This year, it's been a real interesting thing because people are seeing in the credits, what, you were traveling in 2020? No, this was 2019. All right. Um, I have some other people asking. Um, oh, and I'm sorry, Gabe, you, you mentioned, uh, they asked what was the best season for traveling in the Alps. I would say it's summer. Uh, spring and fall, it's between seasons, but it's, you know, their, their, their industry is skiing and hiking. So I would go in the summer in the Alps and in the great parts of the Alps, as we'll see next week and the week after that on Monday Night Travels, uh, there are some certain things that, you know, you're going to have a lot of crowds. They want to make reservations in advance, but certainly the Alps are more reliable and more fun and better in the summer. And um, I have some people um, like Leslie who are wondering if it's possible to travel in these regions of the Alps by public transportation at all, oh. um, or what your transportation recommendations are. Absolutely. Uh, public transportation is really good. A lot of Europeans go through their life and they never even bother to learn how to drive because you don't need to. You can use public transit. Uh, if you're focusing on one area, that's where it's nice to have a public transit pass, like the Swiss Alps are great with a public transit pass. Having said that, I love the flexibility that you have with a car when you, and it's just so fun to drive in the Alps because you get to enjoy that amazing engineering that the Europeans have. They've got these tunnels that are 15 miles long. They've got these incredible, um, uh, super freeways arcing over the Alps. And they've got these breathtaking uh, mountain passes where you zigzag all the way up to the top. And with your car, you can actually drive down these little almost service roads like we did in that last uh, episode when we went up to Valderalm. It would have been tough to get up to Valderalm without a car unless you were gonna be a serious hiker for, for days, you know, but we got up there in half an hour. All right. Um, I also have Rick who is wondering if you would recommend traveling in the Alps with children um, or any tips that you have for that. Oh boy. Well, if you have little tiny children and people say, what should we do? I say, take them to grandma and grandpa's on the way to the airport. Okay. <laughs> so here's to that idea. But if your kids are old enough to enjoy a mountain bike or uh, swimming uh, in a lake in the mountains or, uh, you know, just hiking uh, on these beautiful trails, the Alps are wonderful. Back when our kids were like junior high age, we had one of my favorite family trips ever. And I met uh, the family in Vienna because I was working, but I took two weeks off of my work. And I met the family in Vienna, had a car, and we did lace together all the greatest Alpine stuff in two weeks or 16 days between Vienna and Zurich. And for the kids, it was fantastic. There's lots of great stuff designed for kids as you explore the Alps. All right, um, moving on, Rick, to some questions about the kind of filming and editing of the show. Um, we had a lot of people that were really complimentary about the music. 
Um, and I had Jeff and Julie that were wondering about the theme song for the show, um, how long you've had it or what the oh, yeah. inspiration was. Well, thank you. We've had the theme song forever. We just hired a, a local artist in uh, Seattle to write it. And we, you know, we just um, have that to run and run and there's different versions of it. And then we have a, a license where we can have access to all this beautiful music. But what I am so thankful for really is the artistry of, um, of Steve Camerano. And I'm a musician and, and Steve edits with rhythm and he knows just how to create a, a mood with the, with the music. And it's so fun when you, when you enjoy anything on video to recognize the subtle stuff behind the scenes that the casual viewer enjoys but doesn't even know why it's so enjoyable and uh i'm just i love the the music and i love the the hard physical work that our cameramen do over there i mean they are just running we're working if the sun's out we're shooting i mean if it's raining we're just sitting around kind of waiting but when the sun's out we are shooting and uh you know we've brought home about 150 shows over the years and i'm really thankful for my crew um, speaking of your crew, um, I had Sarah who was wondering who usually drives while you film? Well, now nobody has ever asked that question. In the old days, I used to drive and um, I thought it was, to be honest, kind of dangerous because I'm not the greatest driver. And it just kind of exhausts you when you drive for four hours and then you're on camera. Um, so uh, I don't drive anymore. I sit in the back and I work with my laptop now, which is a real blessing because I get a lot of good writing time as we're driving. And Simon does all the driving. Our producer, Simon Griffith, he wears so many hats. You'd think he's the top half of, a, of a, one of those Russian uh, dolls that has so many things in it. And Simon uh, does everything. Most importantly, he's the, the brilliant producer of the show. He's with me every minute in Europe. And he oversees the, the post-production of the show once we get home. Uh, but also Simon carries the, carries the tripod and, and Simon will park the car and Simon does everything. And uh, <laughs> I was just looking at um, uh, a, a TV show the other night and with my partner and with all the credits we were looking at and we're going, wow, look at all the people involved in that. And I said, yeah, in our TV uh, production team, we have to make up names because we only have three of us, you know. So there's three of us in the field, plus Steve Cameron at home, and then some very important people on our staff at Rick Steve's Europe that help out too. But uh, Simon is, uh, he's, he's just amazingly versatile and hardworking and, and very talented. Um, and one more question about the filming. Um, do you always use a specific shot list or um, do you sometimes kind of capture shots in the moment um, as you're going? You know, I'm, I'm, I've got this, the show scripted out. In fact, this is the script here. I just printed it out and I typed in stuff I wanted to say tonight, you see. But that's the script. And I lived with this script for, for six days. And uh, every night I, I, I massage in everything we did, the positive and the negative serendipity, and I print it out again. So we have an up-to-date script, but it's all there and we have to cover the script. That's what we have to do. So we've got it charted out and every day we have so much to cover. And I really don't, I'm not going over there just to discover stuff. I've traveled enough to know what we need to cover. And I got an agenda. I, there's certain stuff I wanna teach in these shows. Uh, and you saw it in the last show. If you put our show into one of these things that, um, what do you call it, a centrifuge, and you spun it around and all the water went out and it was just the pithy, valuable information, it would be a lot in a 30 minute show. There's 3000 words here and there's a lot of information. Simon's job is to make sure it's viewable and enjoyable to watch. My job is to make sure it teaches and it's, it's productive that way. And together we get that, what I think is that beautiful mix that makes a Rick Steves Europe show. All right, um, I have another question here from Curtis who's wondering if you ever just travel in Europe for enjoyment? anymore? I mean, not this year, but generally, or if you're usually working while you're there? You know, I'm just a sorry, sorry soul. I used to travel for kicks. I, in fact, I've been reading my, my journals lately. Let me just share with you a journal. This is, <laughs> this is my 1975 journal. And that was before I was doing any books because I just wrote my first book in 1980. But I would travel just for kicks and I would fill these journals up with that kind of print. And those are to me nostalgic because then I was traveling for the joy of travel. Now I travel for the joy of learning from my experience and de designing that into talks and guidebooks and TV shows so I can inspire Americans and help Americans travel better, smarter, and in a more, more transformational way. So to answer your question, I don't travel for the joy of just traveling like I'd love to. Someday I will, 
but right now I love my work so much and I take it real seriously. If somebody gave me a free all expenses paid trip to Fiji right now in the nicest hotel on the beach, I'd say 10 days, Fiji, all expenses paid. And it sounds nice, but if I have 10 days, I got to go to Portugal and work on that guidebook. So I'd go back there and make Europe better because our mission at Rick Steves Europe and with, my hundred, with you and 99 other people is to inspire Americans to venture beyond Orlando, to mm -hmm. come home with the most beautiful souvenir. And that is a broader perspective. And uh, we're just so thankful for our mission and we're so thankful for our work. And I'm thankful for the technology that lets us amplify this show to so many people right now. All right, Rick, I have two last questions that we have many times. Um, one that's uh, a bit of a smaller question and then a bigger one. Um, one question is a lot, of, a lot of people, first of all, are eating and drinking along with you tonight. I see that some people have some Dubliner cheese. Pilar had um, some French white wine and people yeah. were wondering specifically what type of red you were enjoying tonight. Ah, what kind of red I'm enjoying? Well, I'm enjoying an Echo. 41. It's a Washington state wine and it's very nice. And, uh, um, oh, shoot. I can't, I forget the name of the cheese I'm eating, but it's my favorite <laughs> cheese. And I actually didn't go to the grocery store. I went to the cheesemonger to get it because, uh, it's worth, uh, sticking out the stinky good stuff. It costs a little more, but it is delicious. And Simon taught me never to eat and talk on camera. So I won't bite into that until we say goodbye. What is the last question, Gabe? All right. So our last question for tonight, obviously, we have a lot of people wondering. Excuse me, Pierre, Pierre Robert. Pierre Robert. It's a nice Pierre French Robert. cheese on a show about <laughs> Italy. Okay. <laughs> Carry on. So the last question is, understandably, a lot of people were curious your thoughts on when we might be able to travel to Europe again. Um, and also just looking forward to perhaps a long winter of no travel, how you keep your spirits up. So when can we go back to Europe? And until then, how can we keep our spirits up and stoke our travel dreams? You know, nobody knows how tough this winter is going to be. Um, we just put lights on our deck so that we can, and we had a, a little gathering of friends around the fireplace outside, but we're not going to have people in our house, you know, and um, it, we're going to work to to, to be responsible and to social distance and, and not, have, not have family gatherings inside, even with the holidays coming up, that's gonna be tough. Um, one reason we're doing Monday night travel is to give people, travelers, some way to, to scratch their travel itches, you know, right now together, every Monday night we can do this. Um, it's gonna be a long winter. Thank goodness we've got some, I think we've got some coordinated, unified, science-based, leadership coming to our country now. And I'm really thankful for that because we can, we can get through this pandemic together, but we all have to be diligent. Patience is not an American virtue. Patience is not a Rick Steves virtue, but these days patience is my middle name. With our company, we're not gonna be the first ones out of the gate. We're gonna take our tours back to Europe. We have 15,000 people with their names on tours right now. As soon as we're gonna be doing tours, people wanna take a Rick Steves tour. I've got a hundred guides in Europe waiting to get some work again, but we're gonna do it when it is safe and reliable. And that's the responsible way to run a tour company. When's that gonna happen? Nobody knows. We're, we've got our hotels and our guides and our buses all primed and ready to go. Uh, if we could do it in the spring of 2021, that would be nice. I'm very doubtful that'll happen. I think it's gonna be a fragile um, kindling of travel again in the fall of 2021. I think we're gonna have a rough but break even year as a tour company in 2022. And then I think we're gonna be back rocking again in 2023. That's my, my conservative estimate. Of course, I hope it's quicker, but I'm not gonna let wishful thinking cloud my judgment. We're gonna get through this. I've lived 65 years without an interruption in my life. And now I've got a couple of years where we're doing things differently than what we might've liked. And I think we need to embrace that. Uh, nobody gets through a, a complete lifetime without some big event derailing things for a couple of years. I mean, think if you were born in 1900, when you're 14 years old, you have World War I. When you're 18, 19 years old, you got the flu pandemic. When you're 29 years old and you just wanna kick things into gear, you got the Great Depression. And then when you got 39 years old, you got Hitler. And finally, you're 45 years old and you can rebuild after the war. Well, okay, we've got two years of a pandemic. We're going to be okay. We're going to do it. And when we do, uh, the world is going to be uh, a place that understands that, uh, you know, the, the, the challenges confronting us in the future are going to be blind to walls. They're going to be impervious to, to conventional defenses. And they're going to be 
fought against with science, with nations working together, and with people looking out for each other. Um, I'm, I'm excited about that. And that's the silver lining of this coronavirus cloud. And as it comes to tourism, it's more important than ever that we get to know our neighbors. And that's our mission. And we're going to do it. So um, I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, for me, this is exciting because I get a chance to, to reach out and connect with travelers. And this is a, a fun celebration. It is Monday night travel. You can put it on your calendar. It's 6 o'clock Seattle time, 9 o'clock East Coast time. And if we fill up, then we'll... We'll book a second show like all of those who are watching right now can enjoy. But all I would like to say right now is thanks for joining us and happy travels, even if we're all just staying home for a little while.